Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to uh, the second in the 2008 uh, summer lecture series. And today, uh, Surabhi Menon is going to talk to us about a subject that um, we all know something about, given the, the way the weather was last week, when the sun came up red and set red, and uh, it was even red at noontime. So now I'm going to uh, have the privilege of introducing Surabhi Menon, who's going to talk to us about the role of particle, uh, particles and gases in regional and global climate change. Dr. Menon is a staff physicist in the environmental energy. Could, I wonder if uh, I could ask you to turn that off, sir? Yeah, thank you. Um, Dr. Menon is a staff physicist in the Environmental Energy Technologies Division, uh, and her e e research interests um, cover global, global climate modeling, the interactions of aerosols and clouds on climate and air quality, and also the socioeconomic impacts of climate change. Dr. Menon's bachelor's and bachelor, master's degrees in physics and mathematics are from the University of Bombay, with a second master's from Purdue and a PhD in atmospheric science from North Carolina State. Before coming to DOE's uh, Berkeley lab in 2003, she was pursuing her research under the auspices of the National Science Foundation and NASA at universities including Purdue and North Carolina State and at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies at Columbia. Her work has taken her to many countries and involved her in many multi-institutional research groups. Notably, Dr. Menon, along with a number of other researchers here at the lab, was a contributor to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Climate Control, pardon me, IPCC, which shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with uh, a fellow named Al Gore. So let's welcome Sarabi Menon. It's a pleasure to be here and to give this lecture. Uh, the topic of my talk is going to be on the climatic role of particles and gases. Uh, this can be a very broad and complicated topic, so I'm not going to try to cover all aspects of it. I'm just going to focus on the atmospheric part of the climate system. There's also the ocean or the land part of it, but that's going to be another talk. Um, so why has climate change become more important? It's in the news all the time. Part of it is due to the fact that we have been warming at an unprecedented rate in the last 50 to 100 years. And part of the other reason is also because of the dramatic impacts of climate change that have been unfolding before us. And that has to do with the ice uh, melting of the polar ice caps. So this is news from the ind independent newspaper, which is from the UK. It was from last Friday. It says, for the first time in human history, ice is on coast to disappear entirely. Now, we've been talking about forming, and we've been saying ice is going to disappear from the poles, but what we were not able to say is that it's going to happen so fast, and that we're going to see it uh, at this time. Um, so this could have profound implications for our future. And the way it appears to be is that industry, economy, and the environment are headed on a collision course, and there is going to be an impact, and that impact is going to unfold before us. Now, we're supposed to be the intelligent species in this planet, so hopefully we would try to find a way to lessen the impact. We cannot avoid it, but we may try to lessen some of that. So to uh, give you an outline of what I'm going to try to cover in these 45 minutes, we just look into the climate record, which exists. Uh, this was uh, probably a record which came out in May of this year, which extends the climate record from the 450,000 years to 800,000 years to present day. We look at what the drivers of climate change are. Then we try to see how can we understand climate change? How do we know what particles or gases do to climate? And then, of course, I give you some examples of global and regional signals of these impacts in the industrial age. Uh, so I'm talking about uh, time frames from 1850, 1880 to present day, and then uh, try to give you a glimpse of what the future could be like. So now let's take a look back at Earth's climate history. So these, were, these are records which were obtained from the Antarctic ice sheet, Eastern Antarctica. It's from a project called Epica. So they drilled, and they drilled through the ice sheets and they got an ice core, and from that, 
based on the isotopic composition of the snow from which you could get the temperature. And um, uh, bubbles of air trapped in the ice, you can get an idea of what, kind of, uh, what the composition of the atmosphere was at that time. So this is the record that has been obtained. This is present day zero, and then you go backwards to 800,000 years. And temperature is the black curve, and green is the amount of methane which was present, which is present in the atmosphere. And in red are the carbon dioxide concentrations. These units are in parts per million, and methane is in parts per billion. And you can see that throughout its history, at least as far as we know from the 800,000 year record, you go through glacial and interglacial cycles. So this is the temperature range, and at the, low, the bottom means we were going to it in ice age. The top means we came out of it. So you go through these cycles about every 100,000 to 150,000 years. And if you look at, we are more interested here in this time uh, scale because that's where we are. Um, you can see that we've come out of a glacial cycle, which means we should warm. So uh, increasing temperature is not a surprise. But what is a surprise is the unprecedented rate at which we've been warming. If you look at the concentrations of methane, they haven't really exceeded 800 parts per billion uh, in the last 800,000 years. Look at CO2. Uh, they haven't gone up more than 300 parts per million. And you look at this uh, graph here, which shows you years before 1950. So you look at this part, this is where a lot of industrial activity took place. And you can see the levels have gone to un, uh, at levels which we've never seen witnessed anywhere in the last million years. So right now, methane concentrations are at 800 parts per billion, and CO2 is at 380 parts per million. So the levels which we see now are things which were never there before. And a lot of it might, so it's not part of the natural cycle. And a lot of this comes because we are spewing a lot of stuff in the atmosphere. Uh, so these, to get these records, you can do it. Uh, these are proxy records which are obtained through different kinds of uh, methods. You can look at sediments de deposited on the ocean flows. You can look at tree rings like these uh, to try to find out what, what the atmosphere was like. Thicker rings usually tend to indicate that conditions were favorable for the growth of the tree. If they're tightly spaced, it means that it was not. So using that, you can try to get some approximation of the uh, temperature and uh, the state of the atmosphere. And you can also look at ice cores, which was the example I showed you previously. These are the bubbles which are trapped in the ice core, which from that you can get the composition of the atmosphere as well. Um, so that was Earth's climate history. So now let's look at things which interest us. That was during the time period which we know instrumentation existed. Uh, so that was probably in the eight, late 80, uh, 1880s onwards. So from that time period, you can look at temperature changes from actual instrumentation, not proxies. Uh, and you can see, uh, you're going. this is the temperature axis uh, in degrees Celsius. You can see from about 14 to 13.5, we've been going up up to about 14.5 degrees Celsius, global temperature on the surface of the Earth. And um, these, the green are the observations, and the red are model runs, but I'll show you more about it a bit later. And you can see uh, what the projections would be, uh, but we'll talk about that a bit later. But you can see that we're supposed to be, we're going to warm, and we're, we have been warming, and we're going to keep warming un unless we do something to change the way we do our industry or other economic activities. So um, we'll, re we'll discuss this a little bit more later, but basically these tend to show you different economic pathways which one might use. And these are designed by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which tries to deliver a report on the state of the climate every five, six years. So the last one was uh, last year. So depending on what activity you uh, pursue, you could go up to about 15.5, so it's about one degree Celsius rise. Or you can go up to 16.5, which is two, or even higher. It just depends on what every country does. So uh, policy can have play an important role in shaping what temperature we might uh, find ourselves in uh, when it comes to 2100. So now let's look at the drivers of climate change. Uh, there are, there's of course the natural cycles for climate change, but uh, the one which we are more interested in is the anthropogenic driver, which is related to man-made man uh, 
activities which generate a lot of uh, gases and particles. So for the greenhouse gases, uh, to start, so you have greenhouse gases and you have, which are all the uh, ozone, methane, nitrogen, carbon, and they have, it's, there's a cycle which is associated with them which can be very complicated. We do not fully understand all the sources and sinks, especially the sinks of carbon. Uh, there's also ozone and methane chemistry taking place, so these can change. If you change um, the amount coming of emissions coming from methane, you might, you might change ozone in a different way because there's complicated chemistry taking place uh, in the troposphere. Then there are aerosols which also come from uh, combustion of fu uh, fossil fuels and from transportation, industrial activity, forest burning. This is a satellite image of forest fires. And as you witnessed last week when we had the forest uh, fires all over California, you could see the air was very hazy because of a lot of these particles. So some of these particles could be sulfates, carbonaceous. Uh, there's sea salt coming from the ocean, there's dust, and then there's nitrates. And these can have an effect on the cycling of water in the atmosphere and the ocean. And there's also land use activity uh, which could generate uh, different kinds of emissions depending on what is done to the land. If you clear it to build, uh, if you clear forest to, uh, for agriculture or if you're clearing it for biofuel purposes, all those things affect uh, the Earth's climate history. So in order to understand what all these things do, you have to look at the climate system in whole if you want to try to predict what the future would be like. And the climate system is very complicated. Uh, we have all the gases, or greenhouse gases, and the aerosols. And um, they, this energy from the sun coming in, which is what drives planet, except for stray asteroids, which can completely change the course of our planet. But here we're just going to focus on solar radiation coming in. Um, that, because of the presence of these gases and particles and uh, particles and gases coming a lot from human influences. And then there's the interaction between the atmosphere and the ocean, between the land and the atmosphere, between the biosphere and the uh, land surfaces. All these interact with each other in very different ways. There's a lot of chemistry going on. Uh, there's a lot of uh, um, fluxes being transferred between the atmosphere and the ocean. And in the end, you get a very complicated picture of what the climate system is. And trying to model that, to, because models are the best way that you could try to get a glimpse of what the future would be, uh, that can be quite complicated because you have to account for everything here. So we've tried to uh, look into what is taken into account and how one might uh, try to study some of these interactions. So to begin with, just going through the basics of what the greenhouse gas is, uh, because that's what is causing a lot of the uh, warming that we have now. So the greenhouse gas effect mainly comes about because of the trapping of the IR radiation, the infrared radiation in the Earth's atmosphere. I think all of you know about it, so I won't really spend time on it. Just to say that um, if you look at the different uh, players for greenhouse gases, you have carbon dioxide, methane, CFCs, ozone, nitrous oxides, and in percentage are the contributions of each of them to uh, global warming. Um, so since the talk is about gases and particles, so coming to particles, we have uh, these particles are what we call aerosols. As I mentioned, they're composed of sulfates, organic, and black carbon, coming to carbonaceous aerosols. And I might use these acronyms for them sometimes, so that's what they mean, organic and black carbon. This does sea salt and nitrates. And these are emitted from uh, forest burning, volcanic eruptions, which generates a lot of sulfate aerosols, uh, which tend to reflect radiation coming in from the sun. So the yellows indicate all the reflections. And um, the, the red arrows indicate some absorption. So all these aerosols, except for black carbon, the, all the aerosols reflect radiation coming in. So what it does is it cools the surface of the earth. So these are, act uh, very differently from greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases warm the planet. Particles such as aerosols, uh, comp which are reflective, sulfates, organic sea salt, nitrates, they reflect radiation, or they could interact with clouds, which are here, if you can see it. Um, they can change the reflectivity of, so they, they reflect radiation, they interact with clouds, and clouds reflect radiation away, so, they, so all of this leads to a cooling of the surface. 
uh, except for black carbon particles, um, these absorb, they absorb radiation in the visible wavelengths, so they heat up the atmosphere. So if you look at the surface to the top, if you have all these particles display, dispersed in the atmosphere, all the other aerosols but black carbon will absorb. But because black carbon is absorbing in the atmosphere, it's cooling the surface. So the message here is all aerosols actually cool the surface. Every, all of them reflect except for black carbon which absorbs, so that gives rise to a different kind of an effect, which I'll show you some examples of as we go on. So these are good because they counteract some of the greenhouse uh, gas-related warming that we witness, and all the greenhouse gases will warm the planet. So now trying to understand how these gases and particles interact in the climate system and trying to see what those impacts are, we could look through what tools are basically used to study climate. Um, so as I, said, uh, I was describing, models are generally very useful as a tool and because they can be used to understand past changes based on sensitivity tests or you could just run the model for, uh, if you give it some input file, it's going to, whatever processes are there, it's going to take, do that and give you an output. So if you tell it what the state of the atmosphere was in 1800, it's going to tell you what the climate was in 1800. So you can do the same thing for the future and that's why they're nice as a predictive tool and also has a sensitivity tool to study climate. So we haven't been doing modeling for a very long time. It really started in the 1970s when there was just atmosphere to study CO2. Green, CO2 is, the most, was, is one of the <coughs> climate forcing agents which has been studied the most. And after, uh, in the mid 1980s, uh, they, uh, it was decided it was not enough to just have the atmosphere. We could put in more physics and actually have a land surface. And then if you have land, then you should also have the ocean and sea ice. And if you do, did all that, then you know, so a lot of simulations were done and they found that uh, you could not match observed temperature records if you just accounted for greenhouse gases. So you had to account for these particles because they help offset some of the warming. So that's why uh, people started putting in the sulfate aerosols, which come about from a, a sulfur cycle model. So basically, these aerosols are formed when SO2, sulfur dioxide gas, is released. That undergoes gas to particle conversion, and they form sulfate particles. Now, these aerosols are usually sub-micrometer in size, so you don't really see them. So sulfur, the sulfur cycle was introduced in the climate models. And then it was decided that sulfates are not enough. There are these other aerosols also being released. So then you had the non-sulfate aerosols, which were the carbonaceous aerosols, the black and the organic carbon. And then you said, okay, now that I've put in all these things, let's not just give the climate model the state of the uh, atmosphere in terms of the chemical composition. Let's not just tell it to use this amount of CO2. Let's actually try to have the budget for CO2. So you have the source terms and you have the sink terms, and that requires a carbon cycle because it operates in uh, a different time lens. There's a short cycle which accounts for uh, respiration and photosynthesis, etc. There's a long <coughs> part of the carbon cycle which accounts for the uh, CO2 getting into the ocean and getting dissolved, forming coal, and then you burn that off and then you get carbon dioxide again. So these, they have very different length scales. So that has been introduced in climate models. And then you have the models which exist today. And now these are called the Earth system models because they're really trying to represent the Earth, all the processes taking place on the, in the Earth. So you have the atmosphere, land, ocean, all the aerosols, carbon cycle, dynamic vegetation because that responds to CO2, especially if you try to do the carbon cycle. And then atmospheric chemistry, because uh, methane and ozone, for example, they all share some common precursors which are responsible for the uh, oxidation, just mainly for oxidation uh, purposes, which is also what is required when you do the sulfate chemistry. So you have complicated atmospheric chemistry taking place. And so an Earth system, a good Earth system model should be able to account for everything. And just to give you a a picture of what this looks like. Um, uh, this was from the early models which just had CO2 and then you started having land, ocean, and then ocean ice and some more um, activities, 
particles, the sulfates, the non-sulfates, uh, carbonaceous, a bit more of the carbon cycle being put in and then the whole climate system with the chemistry. So with that, uh, so with this climate model, you could do predictions of what temperature curves should look like or how temperature would change. And uh, here's temperature over the last 100 years, uh, from 1900 to the year 2000. And this is, the, the observed is in the red, and in orange is results from a climate model without anthropogenic activity. So if you just had natural processes taking place, this is the prediction. And you can see that they don't match up. So to match up, which is done here, the climate model should account for both natural and anthropogenic activity. And then you might try to be closer to uh, observations. So just uh, the first order effects for temperature change is CO2 because that contributes the most. And sulfates from all the aerosols, sulfates are the ones which help for cooling. So that's a second order effect. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the climate model that I use, which is from the Goddard Institute for Space <laughs> Studies. Uh, it can have any number of vertical layers from the surface to the very top of the atmosphere. The resolution is very coarse. Uh, these days, climate models have much finer resolutions. This is 4 by 5 degrees, which is above 400 to 500 kilometers. Uh, a decent, a, a, a good climate model should actually try to go to 0.5 degrees. So it should be a lot finer than what we have. Uh, in this model, we have interactive ozone, methane, and aerosol chemistry because, you know, they all share very similar, uh, ox the oxidation fields, the oxidant fields for all these are very similar. So if you control one, it might affect what is, how ozone, if you control methane, it might affect ozone formation, etc. cetera. It's the same thing for sulfate chemistry. We also, I love for aerosol cloud interactions, aerosols, those particles which can let water vapor condense on them, they can form a cloud droplet, so that can change the cloud properties. And that actually is good because that, ref that helps the cloud reflect more radiation, so in, an, in effect, it can cool the surface of the earth a bit more. And then uh, this at we do the atmospheric version, but it can also be coupled to a dynamic ocean sea ice model and there's a carbon cycle and interactive vegetation being implemented. So it's not yet an Earth system model, but it's trying to get there. And uh, just a note that, remember, it's modeling. All models are wrong, but some models are more useful. So let's try to use this model in a way that we can try to understand what the model does and use it more as a sensitivity tool for our case. Uh, so using this model, we uh, participated in the IPCC uh, exercise, and for that you have to, if you want to predict radiative forcing, which is defined as uh, the change in the balance between the energy coming in and energy going out of the climate system, and that's what drives uh, climate in this planet. The units are in watt per meter squared, the energy per square meter of the Earth's surface. And it's usually measured, if you look at the change in forcing, it's usually that change which is calculated at the tropopause or at the top of the atmosphere. There are several ways to calculate this, but this is the uh, simple way of trying to look at it. A positive forcing implies warming, and that comes from the greenhouse gases. A negative forcing implies cooling, which means uh, lower surface temperatures. So, so that's what I'm, when I talk about forcing, that's what I'm talking about. So here's the forcing in the y-axis in watt per meter square, going from zero to three and up to going down to minus two. Looking at the industrial age, so from 1880, that was around 1850, 1750, 1850, 1880, they're all kind of equal because we really don't know very well how different uh, the composition of the atmosphere was. It's not very well defined. So you could use any time frame, which is fine. So that's 1882, the year 2000, 2003, actually. That's when the simulations ended. Um, all greenhouse gases are shown in red, so they're warming. So you see an increase in temperature up to 3 degrees. It's a cumulative effect of all greenhouse gases. Black carbon, these, the aerosol particles, which cool the surface, but which actually absorb radiation within the atmosphere. So that causes a warming. That's about 0.5. 
Now, it depends on which model you use and what, how you treat the interaction of these particles with the climate system. That number can go up to one watt per meter square, up to about 0.8. And then um, the reflective aerosols, the sulfates, organic, sea salt, nitrates, etc., they are in the pink. So they are the ones which are trying to uh, counterbalance some of the warming from greenhouse gases. So that goes up to minus 0.5. And if we include the aerosol indirect effect, which is here, which is uh, this refers to the effect, uh, the interaction between aerosols and clouds, which increase the reflectivity of clouds. And uh, that leads to cool, cooling on the surface. So that's about minus 0.5. So if you add them up, they're about minus 1.5 to minus 2. But uh, these, this part is the most uncertain in climate change studies. And that number could go up to minus 2, can go range from minus 0.5 to minus 2. And that matters quite a bit, uh, which I'll show you a bit later. Um, so you can put in all these different, the aerosols, the uh, the snow albedo effect, which um, is really re referring to the deposition of these black particles on a white surface, the snow-covered surface, snow being white, it's going to be reflective. If you put something black on it, that reflectivity is not going to be as big. And therefore, there's going to be some bit of warming taking place. And this is something which has been done only in the recent past four or five years. So you do all that, and then you can get an integrated number, which I'll show you in the next plot. But because of all these forcings, there's going to be a response to that, and that's to, do, to look at what that response is. You can just look at the temperature change. This is the temperature change going from minus 0 0.5 to plus 0 0.5. And you can see uh, the observations are in blue. There's a lot of variability. And these are different climate simulations. They're done because you want to initialize the model at different uh, states to avoid uh, uh, just to get a better signal. <coughs> And so you can see that we've been warming up, and we're, pretty, we're matching the observations pretty well. And you can try to get an idea of, so that was the global mean for the, Earth's, for the, for the entire Earth, but you want to see how well, how these are spatially distributed. And to do that, uh, we can look at maps like these, which show you the uh, surface temperature change, 0 0.6. We know that since the industrial age to now, we've warmed up by 0 0.6 degrees Celsius. And that's how that temperature is distributed. More warming in the, pole, pole, in the poles, which is why we have a lot of the melting of the ice caps. And the, this is from the model simulation, uh, which includes all the forcings which I showed you earlier. So that's about 0.55. We don't quite match the observations, but we are pretty close. So with the climate model, because we can use it as a sensitivity tool, we may remove the forcings one by one and see what impact each individual forcing has. That becomes useful when you want to look at policy and you want to control the emissions of CO2 or methane or things like that. Then you want to see what response do you get. And you can do that by looking at what would happen if you just had CO2, that's the temperature. If you put in ozone and methane, the other two important greenhouse gases, it's about 0.4. And they together add up to what CO2 alone does. Um, we don't show the aerosol forcing because it could, it's slightly uh, large in our simulations. <laughs> But here's the BC's effect on snow-covered surfaces, which increases the, uh, the it increases temperature by about 0.04. It's very small, but it's taking place at a region where you really don't want it to be there. And so basically, this is just to show you that we can uh, look at each species by itself to get an idea of how uh, the climate responds to that. And uh, to get the whole integrated picture, here's the uh, this is a very famous plot, which is used quite a lot in our field. Uh, this is from the IPCC, the report, and it tells you the forcing between 1750 to 2005. The forcing in watt per square meter going from 2 to minus 2. CO2 about 1.5, 1.7. Methane, ozone, um, black carbon on snow, land use change, the aerosol effect, which is about minus 0.5. The, there are two kinds of uh, effects of when aerosols interact with, cloud with clouds, you have the change in the reflectivity, which is um, going from about more than minus 0.5 to about minus 2 because it's very uncertain. And there's a second effect which is not added here because it's very uncertain. That's when aerosols can inhibit precipitation in clouds, which allows the cloud to stay much longer and 
the, when it stays there much longer, the reflectivity can go up quite a bit. So that number can be up to minus 1.5. So the aerosol effects can be quite strong. And if you add them all up, the positives and the negatives, with the natural uh, variation coming from changes in the solar irradiance, you get about 1.6. And this 1.6 is what is giving us the 0.6 degree uh, temperature increase. So now just to go into some of the impacts of uh, climate change. OK, uh, so this is an image which shows you the particles, the aerosol particles in the atmosphere. And these are observed from a satellite called MODIS, which is written here. And it measures the optical extinction of light. So if you have a radiation coming in and you have these little particles which are distributed, that light cannot go through. So, it's, so that measure of the extinction of light is given in its unitless term. It's called aerosol optical depth, going from 0 to about 0.5. Um, and depending on the size, because you can see how much they reflect relative to the radiation wavelength, the, the radiation's wavelength, you can try to get an idea of what their size is. And um, red means they're fine particles, and they mostly come from industrial activity. Uh, and green uh, cores, which are usually from the ocean surfaces, so they're more natural sources. So this is basically a loop which just kind of tells you how they're distributed and how industrial activity, forest burning, uh, biomass burning, which takes place mostly in Africa, and South America, all these different things give you these particles which just get distributed. Uh, they might be regional coming from one particular location, but they get uh, transported by the air mass and they can reach a different location. So uh, we might, um, so I wanted to give you three examples from the impacts. One was uh, the interaction that when you have greenhouse gases and aerosols together, what they do. The second example I wanted to give you was just on the role of aerosols, and the third was uh, just on the greenhouse gases. So when you, um, we wanted to look into observations which found that, which said there was global dimming which took place between 1960 to 1990. What this global dimming means is that there was less radiation coming to the Earth's surface. So what it means was the surface was not warming up as much within that time frame. But there was a reversal after 1990, which meant that the surface started getting warm again. And these were taken from measurements of radi radiation instrumentations, which were dispersed at several land locations across the world. And so we wanted to see, can our model uh, simulate these observations? So we do a simulation in which we calculate the linear trend in the radiation for this time period. And we have an experiment where we include all the forcings that we talked about. And then in this experiment, because it's a model, we can do a sensitivity test, we removed all the anthropogenic aerosols. And you can see there's a big difference. There's blue and there's, it's more red here. Uh, this is the radiation at the, on the surface of the Earth. Its units are watt per meter squared. The reds indicate warm. And the blues indicate cool, less radiation coming in. And you can see without aerosols, you're actually warming up quite a bit. And we might also try to separate it into the two uh, time periods where we find that uh, we, can, we go from the school to the warm as expected. And uh, without the aerosols, anthropogenic aerosols, uh, you actually just get a lot redder. So what it tells you is, and there's this response to temperature. These are the observed temperature trends, 0.5 in this time period, with, with, the anthrop with everything without the anthropogenic aerosols, much warmer. So what does this mean? It tells you that um, without, if, you do not, if you do not mitigate greenhouse gases, but if you control aerosols, which were done uh, to reduce acid deposition from sulfate particles, especially in the western part of the world, then uh, you might, the aerosols will no longer be available to mask greenhouse gas effects. So we're going to, if you just control aerosols but not greenhouse gases, Aerosols were masking greenhouse gas effects, so now that will not take place anymore. So you're going to keep warming. And a lot of it is related, um, a lot of this, uh, so the distribution, regional distributions are quite different, and that depends on the types of aerosols that are emitted from different locations. I'm focusing on black carbon. A lot of pioneering work on black carbon was done. It started at this lab by Tisha Novakov in the early 70s, and um, it's become more important in studies now it's a product of incomplete combustion coming from all activities. In Asia, it especially comes from outdoor cooking. 
And uh, these are this is an example of how it's distributed within the, from a model simulation. Nanogram of carbon per meter square per second. So it gives you the time uh, and the area coverage. And we're interested in this industrial component, which is very high in Asia. The units are about 20 to 50 uh, nanograms of carbon per meter square per second. This is from forest burning. Um, Africa and South America are more important. And a lot of these effects can be observed from space. So this is an image showing you black carbon deposition on snow surfaces. This is a city in China, Shenyang, which is a very industrial city. You, can't, you might not really see it, but I try to circle the plumes which are coming, and they're depositing all these pollutants on the snow surfaces, and you can see black versus white. This is an astronaut picture which tries to look into that. And over uh, India, where you have this very large, this is the aerosol optical depth telling you that the amount is very large. That's because a lot of industrial activity taking place. You have the Himalayas, which will not allow the airflow to go across it and deposit some of it in China. So a lot of it is being confined in India. It depends on the circulation and the time. Um, this was taken in December, so it just depends on that time. But you can see it's very high, and this is going to have an impact on climate. And we tried to look into it a little bit in some of our prior work, where we found that um, there was, in China, there's been a tendency for more floods in the south and more droughts to the north. And these trends were the largest observed since 950 AD. So there's something, these trends have been observed um, to be very strong from 1979 to present day. So we tried to see whether we could try to simulate some of that. And we obtained this distribution of aerosols over China, and we found that a large proportion of them were absorbing. Um, we did not have measurements to tell us that, but we just speculated that because of the industrial activity there, a lot of it could be absorbing particles. And when we put that in the simulation, we find that we can generate more rainfall, which is in millimeters per day. This is the precipitation uh, change. We can get more of that in the south, and there are droughts to the north, and there's a spatial redistribution of precipitation. If you remove black carbon, if you have all the other aerosols but do not have the absorbing part, you f we find that we really cannot get this phenomena of increased floods and to the south and droughts to the north. So black carbon can be very important for climate change. I won't talk too much. Uh, this was to just show you that uh, the effects from global warming, which shows the poleward migration rates of isotherms, which has an impact on species. Uh, what this shows you is basically the temperature isotherms where you have fixed temperatures, they're starting to move more towards the pole, which means a lot of uh, animals and plants are going to have to travel further and further away to find the same temperatures at which they were accustomed to in the past. And in the past, lots of extinctions came about when temperatures reached five degrees. So there is that part to worry about too. And also the fact that global warming can lead to, uh, weather and climate are different, but global warming is supposed to lead to more extreme events. So some of it is related, uh, I just show you an example of the dust episode which we had in the 1930s and the hurricanes. A lot of these really come about from changes in the sea surface temperatures, which affects um, circulation and which affects the transport of moisture, which would have an impact. And the same thing for hurricanes. So now just to go a little bit into the future climate. Um, so the most dramatic, as I said, things that uh, we are witnessing right now is the uh, sea ice decline in the Arctic. And this, is the project this was what it was in 1982. And these are different projections of what our climate model suggests would be the Arctic sea ice extent at these different time periods. And now this is 2007, and you can see it's actually more than what the predictions were. So basically, um, Things are melting at a rate faster than we expected, so the models are not keeping up with the actual melt rates that are being observed. And that becomes important because uh, this melting is taking place in the northern latitudes where you have a lot of uh, permafrost, and melting of permafrost can release methane, which is a greenhouse gas more potent than carbon dioxide on a molecule basis. And that could lead to more warming and more melting. So it's a chain reaction which can take place. And you really don't want to start that chain reaction. 
so that was looking into what methane or CO2 do to the Arctic, and we've also looked at what aerosols and ozone do, and we find that, I won't dwell into this much, but just to say that um, looking at three different snapshots of 1980, uh, present day, which is, and 2030 for a future scenario, um, this is the downwelling radiation coming to the surface on the Arctic, and the darker the dark is good, the light indicates that it's warming up. This is a radiation watt per meter square, which means the surface temperature is heating up. And we find we can compare ozone versus aerosol, and we find a lot of contribution comes from the aerosols. And um, so, um, okay, so just going back to this plot, you can see that um, the time history shows that we're going to warm up quite a lot, and all that depends on what economic pathway we choose. So um, I think for us to maintain a climate which is habitable to all of us and which we know of today, as of today, we don't want temperature to go up beyond, to go up to this range. We want temperature to just go up to here because that can be bearable. But if you go up further, you're going to create a lot of other problems. And... Um, a lot of that comes about by actions you can do on an individual level, but also from policy. You need strong policy to control greenhouse gases or particles. We had one success story from uh, when we had the ozone hole, which made a lot of headlines. And there was, you can see how uh, this is 1940 to the year 2000, annual production. How that was going up, the ozone hole was discovered by this Nobel winning prize paper. There were a lot of non-binding and uh, protocols which uh, policy, uh, implica policy actions which were taken, and then there was very strict controls, and you can see a big decline which helped the recovery of the ozone hole. So we can look at past examples where we were able, when ozone hole was a big story, there was action taken to control some of that. So now the Arctic ice is melting, so hopefully policy action can be, t we, we need strict policy to control that. Uh, just to summarize, uh, climate change, we know surface temperatures have gone up mainly from greenhouse gases, but we also know that we need anthropogenic aerosols to mimic the pattern of climate change in the last uh, 100 years. And these aerosols directly impact climate and may mask some of the greenhouse gas effects that we see. For future climate, a lot of it depends on what emission pathways we follow, which is really dictated by policy. The Arctic region is, is especially vulnerable to climate change from global warming and also from aerosols. And I didn't show you a little bit of this, but air quality effects are going to be pretty uh, severe in locations such as India where they were not uh, as, <laughs> ozone effects were not as dominant before. But of course, like I, you know, as I showed you, it's a model and uh, some models might be useful. So there's uh, a lot of uncertainty in our simulations. A lot of it comes from not knowing what these emission sources were and also whether we have included every interaction and feedback. Ice sheets are melting at a faster rate than we predict. So maybe our ice sheet models are not doing a good enough job, and so we have to figure that out. And uh, just to conclude, I'd like to acknowledge funding support from NASA, uh, LDRD here, DOE programs, and all my collaborators at the NASA Goddard Institute who, um, who I work with in, the model, uh, in doing the modeling for climate change, and also, um, people here in this division, Tisha Novikov and Igor, who works with me, and a lot of the summer students who've come over the last few years who've helped with satellite data analysis and model simulations. And I'll end. So these are just examples of what you might try to do on an individual level without trying to geoengineer climate. Thank you very much. So I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll uh, try to run this microphone to anybody who has a question, and if that doesn't work, then we'll fall back on repeating them, but here we go. Uh, what is the effect on your models of having uh, low resolution? Sorry? What is, what is the effect on your model of having low resolution? What if instead of the, you know, the five degrees that you have now, you have 0.5 degrees? Uh, would, it, would the models be much more accurate? Would it make a difference? It, it would, and yeah, what's, I mean, what's preventing you from using such models? Oh, it's just uh, the resources to run long simulations. When we want to run long-term climate 
uh, long climate simulations of 100 years plus. These take a lot of computation, it's a lot of computational resource limited. And with, if the model is able to run on more nodes, for example, you can get better resolutions and that's really what we need. So a lot of it is limited by just not um, able to get the right resources to run the model at better resolutions. And that would make an impact on the climate uh, impacts that we see. Yes. You mentioned the uh, dust storms and hurricanes. And also you mentioned uh, forest fires. How you took into account the influence of particles on the wind uh, in your model? Yes, yeah, so in our model we have dust, which is... Uh, no, no, I understand that yeah. you have dust or water droplet or everything. Yeah. I'm speaking now about the model. Right. How you took into account in your model yes. the influence of dust for instance, or ocean droplets for hurricanes? Uh, so we don't really do hurricanes because we don't have the resolution to model that the right way, so we can't really do that. But for dust, we have uh, the source function is a fu the source is a function of the wind speed. Uh, what is a function of wind speed? The dust sources. Yes. So it's a function of wind speed and the surface types because... Then I, uh, the special question. Yes. The basic uh, influence of particles is due to the influence on the uh, uh, turbulence, atmospheric turbulence. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the balance of turbulence, uh, of turbulent energy. Yes. Did you take into account the changes of turbulent energy? Sure. In which way? Uh, they take, we have a, there's a planetary boundary layer scheme in the model which accounts for turbulence, but because of the resolution of the model, we cannot account for these small scale turbulent flows, and those are parametrized. Uh, you know, parametrized is, means taken from the ceiling. Yes. But, <laughs> You know it better. Uh, but the point is, I'm asking uh, the key question. If you don't take into account in all scales the influence mm -hmm. of particles on the turbulent boundary, uh, on the turbulent balance, yes. you will come to an incorrect result, right. I'm um, afraid. Yes. But uh, the point is, what is the term? in these equations, which is responsible for uh, uh, the particles. Um, maybe we could pursue that one uh, at more okay. detail after the uh, lecture is yeah. over. Thank you. It's a good question. You can yeah. tackle it now. Yeah. But, uh, we yeah. have a lot of yeah. issues with the turbulence well, parametrization. I'm speaking about okay. Okay. I, I There's one up there. Oh, right, that's, that's fine, too. Uh, you were saying uh, that uh, the climate, uh, the first slide, I think, was like warming and cooling and warming and cooling for the last 800,000 years. Why was it warming 700,000 years before when none of the natural, I mean, the man-made effects were? But there are various reasons for these abrupt shifts. And uh, I don't think everything is well explained by theory so far. But these are just abrupt climate change which takes place, which could, uh, I think they're still trying to decipher why carbon dioxide concentrations would go up at a certain level. But it comes from just release from the ocean perhaps or things like that. But I think that theory is still not well understood in terms of what causes the composition to change so dramatically. So that's um, maybe, Bill, called, Bill, maybe you might have an answer to abrupt climate change. Uh, well, some of those changes are caused just by changes in the sun's solar variability. Solar variability is yeah. quite predictable. Yeah. Um, uh, some of the changes that we're, you see in the, the ice record are due simply to very predictable changes in the amount of sunlight hitting the northern hemisphere. And so when that pattern changes, you can easily warm the planet. It's very predictable from Newton's laws. And that explains some of the periodicity you see in the ice core record.
No, it's the, also the uh, increase in the concentrations of after the ice age, which just goes up. I think that's still not well. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question, related question on the same uh, climate record plot. You mentioned that the CO2 levels are at an unprecedented level. Is it conceivable that those levels were there in the past, but they're time averaged over the climate record? I mean, yeah, I mean, they're trying to dig more ice cores to get a longer record because we had it till about uh, 450,000 years. And so this was just released in May, which was up to 800,000 years. So they need to look at longer time records to see what levels of CO2 were ever were present at any time. Oh, the resolution? Yeah, the resolution. I mean, for the hundreds Sorry. of thousands of years, I imagine that the binning is pretty, pretty coarse, whereas in modern okay. times, it's a little finer. So yeah. could, could those higher, could there have been higher no, frequency no, oscillations no. that no. averaged out in those, no. those records? No, the, the paper which talked about the ice core records did not, did not report any CO2 concentrations which were that high, as we have right now. So I don't know if it's, I mean, these are proxy records in that sense. We have instrument, instrumentation now, so our records are a bit better. But based on those proxy records, I mean, um, if you look at methane, it, the highest was about 800, it's 1800, so that's a huge difference. CO2, maybe not as much, but methane, certainly you can see that. Uh, yeah, this might be a really stupid question, but uh, bear with me. Uh, you said there's like a, greenhouse gases which are increasing the temperature and contributing to warming, whereas there are the aerosols which are helping counterbalance that. Is there any way to manipulate those aerosols to make it better? Yeah, so that's what, um, I actually have a plot just for you, <laughs> which, is, which is on uh, volcanic eruptions. We've seen that take place in every time there's been a volcanic eruption, and the most spectacular was the one which took place in the tropics, Mount Pinatubo in Philippines and in the 90s, and that released a lot of SO2, sulfur dioxide gas, into the atmosphere. And those became particles which helped cool the surface, and you can see a big dip globally in temperatures after the eruption of the uh, volcano. And that has been suggested to be one way where you could try to, so that's what they call geoengineering climate, release a lot of these sulfate particles in the stratosphere so they reflect sunlight. There's uh, papers which talk about in, uh, putting a lot of mirrors on the ocean surface to reflect sunlight and releasing sprays of sea salt which could, again, act like the aerosols reflecting some of the sunlight. But this is all somewhat newer concepts which have come about. And just uh, this week, I think there was a study which looked, tried to look into the full impacts of what would happen if you had geoengineer the planet. And some of the consequences are not well understood, but it's not something you really want to do except when you're in a real dire emergency. I don't think it's well um, researched as yet, so it's something still new. Here we go. I was just wondering how it is that you can sort of take a look at the air bubbles trapped in the ice and is this really a true sampling of the climate at that time? Do you know that the carbon dioxide concentrations over Antarctica and a couple other very specific regions of the globe are really representative for the overall climate, not only over the entire globe, but also way up in the stratosphere and that sort No, of I mean, it's, so these are just proxy records, so that's the best we can get. But you could also use, uh, you can look at so you can look at the bubbles to get an idea of the atmospheric composition, and you can look at the isotopes to get at what the temperature could be, and you can map them up, and you can use, you can, and if you say these were the concentrations, in a, you put it in a climate model, and you say these were the concentrations, what, what temperature do you generate? And you can use some of those same records and look at present day climate and try to evaluate a little bit about, a little bit. But I mean, the best thing we have now are instruments which actually tell you what, the, what these measurements are. So that's much better. So the only way we can get at what it was 800,000 years ago are by these proxy records and reconstruction. He, 
There's one more question. There. One more? Oh, oh good. Sorry. <laughs> So, but then when you're saying it's the highest concentrations ever, are you comparing it, the concentrations in the ice core now that were taken, the ice cores, to the concentrations in the air surrounding the ice cores that could conceivably become trapped in ice cores again, or no, is it so just compared to the atmosphere in general? It's how much you drill which makes a difference, so it, because of the snowfall piling on and on. So, no, I don't think that can smear the record that much. Okay, well thank you very much. If there are no more questions. Okay.